Hi, everybody, right. and welcome. Um, I'm Dr. Pamela Rutledge. As Ignacio said, I am faculty at Fielding Graduate University in the Media Psychology Program. And I want to talk a little bit today, not about you know the curriculum and all that stuff, although we can answer those questions, but I want to talk a little bit about a subject that is very powerful for me, and that is positive media psychology and how to harness the power of media for good. So here's approximately what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a few introductions, give you a little background about myself, a little background about how you define the field. I want to talk about why the theory matters and then give you a bunch of examples of positive media psychology in action. So who the heck am I, right? My background is not a traditional academic and that's important only because people come to media psychology from so many different areas. I started actually as a media producer in communications and design. I went into business, I did clinical psychology and I ended up in media psychology because because for me, that made sense. So keep that in mind if you're wondering if this is a fit for you because there is no single road to media psychology. It's really what you're trying to do with it. Let me back up before I talk about positive media psychology and talk about exactly what is media psychology. A lot of people assume that because you use the word media that you're talking about mass media or you're talking about what's in the media. But media psychology really looks at media in a very broad sense. It defines it in terms of users and um, creators and people who distribute and all of those things from software development and content development to how often you use your phone. So it's, it's a very wide field, which means it has a lot of applications, but for me, a lot of potential. So what a media psychologist study? We look at media impact. We look at the process of media, all these internal uh, psychological things going on, motivation, attention, perception. We look at the interaction, not just in between people and media, but between people with each other that's enabled by technology. And then we look at media expression. How do people use media to express themselves? And so the, why is this important? It's important because media psychology goes far beyond traditional media studies. It's really after the why people are doing things and the why tells us what things we can do to make it better. So positive media psychology is the application of positive psychology to media psychology makes sense. Positive psychology was a big shift in the field of psychology in about the 80s where people realized that psychology had been totally focused on what they call the medical model. In other words, what's wrong and how do we make that better? Rather than looking at the whole span of human experience, figuring out how you also understand the positive end and how you can make more of it, how you can support people's uh, goals to be, you know, grow, to be strong, to uh, really live up to their potential and to feel like they've had a life worth living. We apply positive psychology to media psychology so that we can start thinking about the benefits and the potential tweaks that we can do to increase the benefits of all kinds of media and technology use and design. This paradigm really changes our perspective from what's wrong to what's right. You know, there's, there's a real sort of a cute saying from Douglas Adams, who's a, a writer saying that the technology that exists when we're born is, is normal, right? So whatever we had when we were born, that's normal. Anything that was invented before we turned 35 is pretty exciting. Anything that comes after we're 35 is suspect and probably dangerous. The reason that this is important, and it's not really a joke, right? Because it, you, you're used to what you grew up with, that's normal. The reason that this is important is that these assumptions live within our brains. We don't often think about them, but our assumptions guide the questions that we ask. You know, history is full of all these technology scares for people who were uh, visited with technology that came after they were 35. You know, Socrates thought that writing was gonna cause memory loss. They've been, media has been accused of all kinds of things from social isolation, and that was in the 1700s, all the way up to destroying your moral values, which is what they said about um, email when that first started. 
So we've, we've seen a lot of it. You've all been aware of it. People, you know, talking about the negatives of video gaming, the negatives of social media. There's plenty of people looking for the problems. And the reason is that we presume that, that make that basic assumption about what's wrong versus what are we trying to do and how do we get there? And where is technology adding to that? Or is it taking away? It's not a it's not a rose colored glasses thing. It's just a look that at the entire spectrum. So positive media psychology uses the constructs from positive psychology. It is a psychological science. It isn't just you know you know don't worry be happy. It is rooted in research and it asks questions like where, when, and why do positive experiences occur in relation to technology and media. How do we encourage positive change using those tools? And how do we use media and technology to create structures that will promote positive outcomes? So some of the things that we look at from a positive psychology perspective when we're doing research or we're asking questions are all the things that make up with this concept of well-being. So we look at happiness, both happiness that's fleeting, you know, the sort of joyful momentary happiness, but we also look at happiness that's defined as eudaimonic happiness, which is how we make meaning out of things, how things come, to, we come to value them and how those make us feel. There are several models that talk about the impact of positive emotions on things like resilience and our ability to uh, withstand challenges and our willingness to take risks. We look at things like, um, do we have uh, social connectedness? Where is that fitting in? Or the theory of flow, which you may have heard, which is very big in gaming research, which is really where you're so absorbed in something that the task that you're working on really matches up with the skills that you have. And there's this feedback loop and you're just sort of in it. Um, we also look at virtues and values, right? So we look at how does technology help us build and support things like empathy and courage and resilience. So all of these things are sort of on the table when we're looking at different kinds of media and technology experiences. And don't hesitate if you have a question to put it into the chat window. I don't mind being interrupted at all, but you'll find that I hardly ever take a breath. So you will have to interrupt me if you have a question. Okay, so here's what we know. So here's some basic assumptions, right? Our social world isn't restricted to one place or another. It's this continuum that runs from online to offline. We also know that the brain does not change as fast as technology does. So we have a lag in how we get, we start to understand things and can use them. Digital technologies amplify and enable and constrain behaviors, but they do not change our fundamentals. They do not change our basic needs and they don't make you do things you wouldn't otherwise do. Technology and behavior are integrated, right? They co-evolve. What we do impacts the technology. What the technology does impacts us. And, you know, technology that works, that delivers on what people are trying to do will survive. So people are not platform loyal. They are function loyal, which is a really important thing. And it's why Facebook keeps buying things because it watches people have new needs and new goals and new desires. And it has to be there to supply those or there will be no Facebook. My assumptions, which really inform how I look at the world, are that media psychology, positive media psychology, they start with psychology. I don't start with a tool. I start with the psychology and I work my way to understanding the tool based upon what I know about human behavior and behavioral science. Another assumption that's very important is that audiences are not passive victims. They are what we call agentic. They do stuff. They have goals, they act, and they um, expect results. But we can't just assume people are out there sitting there being victims of impact. They're active participants. We all, I also know that the brain processes media content as real. We have the same physiological reactions to media content that we do in real life. Media technologies are tools and media use is functional. There is a point to every media use we take. It might not be a high, you know, a highbrow point or it might not be a totally elevated point. We might just want to escape for an afternoon, but there is a point to our choices. 
and people will take the most effective path to meet their goals. Now, does that mean they take the most beneficial path to their life or to themselves if they're not thinking about it? No, of course not. But it means that they will, within the options that they have, they'll choose the best way possible. And media experiences are not are, but they vary across platforms. So the same content even will be perceived and interpreted differently depending upon where it's consumed. So there's a field called positive technology that is really looks at how do we use technology to empower change? How do we build structures that do things like support behavior change, right? That encourage people to follow through on um, health care, uh, processes or support or recovery, all these various things that that technology can do to increase increase our well being, make us feel better, uh, support our efforts to make change, help us learn. All of those things are part of the po positive technology movement. You know, when I said that media was a really broad field. You know, then you say to the question, well, where can we make a difference? And I always think, well, where can't you make a difference? If you understand human behavior and you understand how people act and are impacted with technology, you could do research, you can um, inform public policy, but there's every industry is now dealing with the ramifications of media and technology. So there are opportunities for people to follow their passions in many different ways. Um, I have uh, some students who come from a uh, healthcare, mental health background who are using media psychology to create communities of support or to create interventions targeting specific things. I had one student who was looking at how she could use storytelling classes to make 80 year olds um, and older feel much more connected because they were very isolated, especially during COVID. So there's a lot of different ways to think about positive media psychology. How can we take what we have? How can we understand it and see where it's helping or hurting? And then once we understand that, what can we do to make it better? So let's just run through some examples for you um, of, of where you can make a difference with positive media psychology. And obviously one is an entertainment medium. Right, whether you're doing positive messaging or whether you are creating narratives that um, teach people things that model new behaviors and uh, give them a sense of options that they didn't have before. And another is fan experiences. You know, for people used to poo poo what it, what it meant to be a fan and made fun of the people at Comic Con, but there is such a benefit from sharing experience and sharing imagination and creativity and making that connection and having those relationships that we have with those properties. You know, that for, for all of us, there was some character, some book, some TV show that was sort of pivotal in our growing up that maybe when you were seven or eight, you used to pretend to be those characters or maybe you use them as an escape or maybe they allowed you to think about yourself in a different way. So there's a lot of different ways that entertainment media can have a profound and positive impact. I thought that uh, Marie Kondo is an interesting example because what she's asking people to do, spreading joy, recognizing the benefits that you're getting out of different technology or different objects that you own, deciding what gives you joy and keeping it does two things. First of all, there's a, an exercise in positive psychology called a gratitude journal or appreciation where you identify th three things every day that you're grateful for. When Marie Kondo asks you to choose things that give you joy, you have now labeled cognitively labeled everything in your house that you kept that gives you joy, right? So you now have a different perception of these things that remain as something that is not just you kept it, but is something that has a positive impact on how you feel. Uh, a super interesting uh, use of positive psychology has been in what we call education entertainment. Back in the 1970s, there was a telenovela, which is a, a sort of a soap opera in Peru. And it was called Simplemente Maria. And it was about 
lovely Maria who comes to town. She's very poor. She gets a job in a house. The, she's abused by the owner's son. She gets pregnant. She gets fired. She goes out. But Maria's just, you know, full of resilience. She raises her daughter. She teaches herself how to sew, starts a business, enrolls in literacy classes. And, you know, two seasons later, she's, um, you know, all is good and she's met the love of her life. Well, the interesting thing about this show was that during the course of Simplementa Maria, when she was learning to sew and taking literacy classes, the sales of sewing machines skyrocketed and enrollment in literacy classes similarly went up. So the producers realized that they had a very powerful model here to introduce options of behavior and inspire people to make change rather than lecturing them to make change. That model has been used, it's called the Sabido model or the Sabido methodology. And that model has been used all over the world on you know, serial uh, narratives, radio, television, whatever is going to give the population that's the target the most opportunity to engage with it, talk about it and normalize new behaviors. One of the more recent examples you maybe saw was on Hulu that was called East Los High. And the whole point of East Los High was to help um, the Latinx population, especially the young women, understand that there were options to dropping out of school if you were pregnant. There were options to preventing pregnancy and there were options to maintaining um, connection and educational opportunities. They created this long story, but this one was built in what we would call a transmedia strategy, which means that they didn't restrict it just to the show on Hulu. They had websites and YouTube videos teaching you the dance moves from the, the dance squad at East Los High. You could connect with different characters as part of uh, the YouTube series on their vlogs. So you really had all these ways of connecting with these different characters. Um, it was very successful. There, the um, measures of things like links to Planned Parenthood um, and those kinds of resources dramatically uh, had dramatic numbers based upon uh, this show. So these things, even though they seem like entertainment, are grounded in very clear theories about behavior change and what engages people and what gives them meaning and are tremendously powerful. At the end of the end of the scale with the, you know, not designed intentionally are things that like jokes and memes and silly things. We tend to, as a culture, underestimate the power of positive emotion. So if you're tired watching silly cat videos is actually a productive thing to do because laughing, smiling changes your physiology. So sometimes positive media psychology is helping people to see that these moments of joy have physiological and psychological benefits. I mentioned a minute ago, the power of fandom, that sense of connection the ability to create content. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways uh, that people have, have created user-generated content, fan fiction. You think back to Harry Potter in particular, the number of people and young people too, who participated in creating alternate stories with those characters that have been, um, have, have really added a lot to, to their lives and allowed them to get together and share because we're now connected with social media and peer-to-peer -peer content. Another big area for positive media psychology is um, interactive experiences. So let me use Peloton for an example. I'm working with a student right now and we're doing some research on the experience of Peloton where they have really targeted several different aspects that increases the user's ability to connect with the instructor to connect with each other, to get information about their progress, to do all of these things that creates not just our, I wish you were there or you felt like you're there experience, but that has other kinds of elements that support motivation and behavior change. Similarly, we have so many options these days of personal data and wearables, the way we can get information about anything that we're working on or need to do, or all of this sort of technological support that reinforces a structure 
that helps us achieve our goals. You know, whether I've set my alarm so I don't miss this webinar or whether or not you're, mar you're watching your steps or, or charting your glasses of water, technology provides all these different kinds of ways to support different kinds of behavioral goals and emotional goals. Uh, we've seen a big, big uptick in education interfaces due to COVID, you know, opportunities where kids can engage online that are based on positive psychology principles, positive feedback, um, emphasizing, you know, strengths rather than weaknesses, cultivating intrinsic internal motivation versus extrinsic or external motivation. So all of these things are different kinds of ways that um, inter interactive media can create uh, positive experiences for us to research, for us to analyze, or for us to inform. You know, it's one of the things that I do is I work with entertainment companies and help them to see what's the audience saying, what, how are they reacting to this, and how do you respond in a way that supports them, makes them, you know, not just makes them happy, but sort of acknowledges that the meaning that they're getting out of it so that they are more engaged with your content. Obviously, the world is this technology world is full of social experiences. I mean, we're we're between texting and social media and email and one thing or another. We you know we're all connected. Matter of fact, there's been sort of what I think of as a license to Zoom during COVID. It's like everybody thinks they need a meeting. I have three times as many meetings as I would have had in real life. I don't know what the deal is, but people are hungry for social experiences. So one of the initial um, sort of call it, you know, moral panics of um, around social media was this idea of the selfie that somehow that was very narcissistic or, you know, it was a, a sort of a negative thing to do. But it turns out that it also allowed people to do something they'd never been able to do before, which was to control their image in a very meaningful way. And they could use those images to communicate different kinds of feelings and emotions that they were having. And this is one of my favorite where this woman has taken a selfie of herself, but she has Bell's palsy, which means that part of her face has, it doesn't move um, normally. And, you know, I, that so impressed me that she was willing to say, you know, here I am, I own this and I'm willing to share it, but think how that normalizes the experience for other people who are struggling with different kinds of things. So we tend to, as I was saying, you know, about this sort of how you judge things, we judge it based upon some standards that we sort of came with, you know, oh, well, people who have pictures of themselves, they must be narcissists, rather than stopping to think, what else could be going on here that has a positive benefit? Uh, and you've all been on Zoom in the last, you know, year, but what's been, was interesting to me about all this, aside from the fact that it technology really did something that we that was important, which is it allows it allowed us during all this social isolation to maintain a level of contact and connection, emotional connection that would not have been possible otherwise. But what it's done is it's brought grandma online, right? My soon to be 90 year old stepmom now zooms with the family on the weekends and she'll never go back because when she zooms, she can see their faces. So it's much better than just a phone call. So there's some of these connections that aren't gonna go away just because COVID does, because it's actually enriched people's lives. Um, I love this, the idea of creation. I mean, some of the social medias, YouTube, TikTok, they're really inspiring, not that the content is so great, but that people are so willing to be creative and silly and just put themselves out there. You know, we see a big, a big amount of sort of remix where you take this and you lip sync that and you sort of mash these things together to create new content, which is empowering to the user, of course, and it is, um, but it's inspiring to the audience. The other thing that technology has allowed us to do is it's allowed us to reach beyond our geographical constraints. We can, and this example is was the it, it Gets Better project. It was an opportunity for people who were concerned about the LGBTQ community not having support, especially the young kids, because there had been some suicides and that this was in response to 
to actually create a means of connecting people that wouldn't be able to find each other otherwise. Anytime people are marketing, it's essentially persuasive media. And if you think about it, all media is in some sense persuasive. You talk to someone because you want them to respond or because you want them to get information to do something. So from that sort of broad sense, all media is persuasive. But what I think is really powerful about positive media psychology is looking at marketing through that lens, right? Where you have companies now selling to strengths and aspirations rather than to the deficit. It isn't like you smell, you're gonna be really unpopular unless you use my product. It's, you know, you're creative, expand your creativity. Or in the case of Dove, who's been on a, on a, a long-term commitment to uh, female empowerment is redefining beauty and empowering people to own their own beauty and to own themselves. So that's a big switch. And those are places where positive media psychologists can, can add insight to say, hey, these are the things that, when you, that you can do to actually do that. Because I've seen some empowerment marketing that has not been empowering because they didn't involve um, somebody who actually knew something about psychology. This trend towards the positive, socially responsible social justice is really showing up in a lot of different ways. And one of them that really falls under the banner of positive media psychology is what I would call cause marketing, where a company uses their technology to enable the support of a cause. Now, this has to be done very carefully because if the cause and the company don't align, it just looks like a marketing gimmick. But there have been many cases where people have done a lot. Uh, Uber was um, allowing people to swipe to create donations for blankets that Uber would then to deliver uh, to the Save the Children organization in the UK. So that was very well aligned. They made it very easy to donate a small amount of money. If you get a lot of people doing a little bit, you get a lot. We also see an increase in use in therapeutic media. This is an important area because it really speaks to increasing access to treatment to people who are not getting it. You know, whether they're not getting it because of socioeconomics or because they're um, in an isolated area, you know, they're very rural. There are a lot of different ways that media now can connect people with experts and also support self-help but there's been an increase in teletherapy, doctors with a distance. And you know, the nice thing about COVID, if there's a nice thing about COVID, is that it has helped people to understand that that is an effective way of getting treatment, that speaking to someone virtually is, has, has real value, that you don't have to go hang around the doctor's office to have this work out. There are a bunch of positive, I think a positive psychology to go um, in the app store, you know, there are so many apps that are um, there for self-help. They are not all, however, based on psychological theory. Some of them are. It's always good to do some research, but if you look at things like Headspace or Live Happy or Happify, MindShift, all of these are based upon psychological principles that promote well-being through various avenues. You know, obviously Headspace is, is looking at it through mindfulness and meditation, which we know from the research increases your sense of general well-being. Uh, MindShift takes a cognitive behavioral approach to improving um, mood and outlook by reframing events in the day. It's a different approach, equally as effective, just a different avenue. Positive media psychology has also given us a new appreciation for other kinds of mediated experience, right? Creative expression in art. You know, there've been a really interesting studies looking at how art therapy changes the wellness path of cancer patients, giving them a sense of meaning and purpose as they're going through treatment. 
Um, I love this example. Um, a friend of mine, Skip Rizzo at USC, is doing some amazing stuff with virtual reality and PTSD. So they're creating immersive environments because one of the treatments for PTSD or any kind of phobia is exposure treatment. Well, you're certainly not gonna send a guy with PTSD back to Afghanistan to try and help him get over his PTSD. So they create immersion therapy to put them in situations that are on the one hand completely safe, but will trigger some of those things so that they can start to work through them with the help of a therapist, obviously. And, um, but it's been very effective. The other thing that had, they've been doing is aside from sort of skills training and, and those kinds of things um, is that they have created avatars that do initial psychological assessment of guys coming back from the front. Interestingly, the soldiers are much more willing to disclose personal information to the avatar than they are to a real person because there's such a stigma in the military about needing mental um, health support that they hesitate to be honest when they're talking to a real person. So even though they know at the end of the day, a real person's gonna you know, review the tape or read the transcript, the act of knowing that that person is an avatar has really allowed them to provide the right kind of treatment to a lot more people. So social impact of media, right? So what's what's going on? How do how does this um, this socially networked peer networked uh, environment reinforce positive things? Well, when you think about what we're doing with technology, first of all, we have the use of the technology, but we also have some sign of social piece going on because we're not using technology in isolation. We're using it with others. And in fact, Weight Watchers has now integrated a fully social um, angle to their, uh, their app and to their service where you can connect with real people, you can connect with a group of people, you can choose all kinds of ways to use social support to reinforce your technology use, you know, logging your food and managing your, um, your weight and exercise. Those kinds of things, that reinforcement doubles up and leads to behavior change. But some really cool stuff is going on in places where we normally wouldn't see it. The Minobi Foundation, for example, has figured out how to give farmers a mobile app that gives them the current price of the food they're growing. These people cannot read, they are not literate, but they know numbers. And so they've used an image and number system that has raised their income in some cases by almost 400% because it takes out the power of the middleman who's telling them what they'll give them when they have no knowledge of what's happening at the market. Similarly, mobile apps have allowed people in rural areas to register births. If you're not registered in a lot of countries, you can't, you would have no access to the social services that are available. By registering a birth, you're setting a child up to be able to attend school, to get medical care, to all of those things that are, you know, are, are the rights of citizens. But if you don't exist officially, you don't have access. We also see mobile language learning, especially in rural areas. And the, the interesting thing about this to me was that in this particular study, they found that, that the students who made the most progress using a mobile app were actually the ones who were doing the worst when they started, that the mobile app increased their motivation, their sense of competence, whatever was going on, that's the next study that needs to be done to understand the dynamics. But that was a really important finding that, that there were certain groups of people where this really made a big difference. We've also seen it in rural India, the use of literacy through mobile um, language learning. But even think about how, how we've used technology to support you know, crises. And uh, Zynga, when, when the J Japan earthquake happened, allowed people to donate to the Japan earthquake relief through playing Zynga on Facebook which raised a huge amount of money that would not have happened otherwise. It also allows us to be connected with people who 
want money where we're connected directly to the person that we're helping. In the case of Kiva, these aren't donations, these are loans. You pick someone, you read about their story, you decide how much of what they need you're willing to loan them. At the point when they get the full amount of the loan, they actually pay you back over time. So it's an opportunity to lend a helping hand to someone to know who it is, and, but if you can't afford to donate the money, it allows you to be repaid. PayPal enabled the Red Cross to raise $5 million within the first 24 hours after the Haitian earthquake. That was unprecedented. We also see people using technology, not just to support their marketing, which was certainly true of Tom's shoes, but to change the way businesses, business was done, to create what's called social entrepreneurship, where they are um, have a new business model. They give away one pair of shoes for every pair that is sold. So technology has enabled all these different kinds of ways of people uh, creating things, getting after things. Um, the final thing that I want to mention is the importance of media literacy. So this is sort of where you end up at the end of the day is how do you teach people to use media well? And the only way we're going to do that is if we start teaching kids at an early age what it means to be a good digital citizen, what it means to have critical thinking about media and media content. Um, I'm extraordinarily proud of a fielding graduate, a former student of mine who came in as a documentary filmmaker and left with a fire in her belly to create a media literacy program, which she has done for middle school that is now in nearly 50 states. She has created these simple lessons where people can learn the things that they need to learn to be able to use media well. So, and I think I touched on this. So I use positive media psychology professionally in the interaction that I have with, with clients, whether they're entertainment or advertising agencies, helping them to see the sort of positive angle and helping them to be true to the research. Um, I use it in my writing and, and research. Uh, the, the Peloton study I mentioned, that we're looking at. And I also obviously use it in courses and con concentrations that we have. We teach positive media psychology. I also teach brand psychology and transmedia storytelling, which is sort of captures that education entertainment stuff and look at audience engagement. How do you engage people that it develops their strengths and immersive media and social activism? How do you use immersive media for that specific purpose of social activism and social justice? So that sort of rounds up um, positive media psychology. Uh, you know, it, it, it's funny when I was starting to think about positive media psychology, I thought, you know, from my point of view, it's sort of synonymous with media psychology because I think of media psychology as an applied sport, right? It's not something I'm doing in an ivory tower. I want to, I want to make something happen. I also think of it as um, something that that gives us tremendous power if we can translate theory into research. But to me, the positive media psychology is how I approach media psychology in general. You know, there's plenty of people looking for the problem. So some of us need to figure out what's going on that's working well, how to make more of it, and how to take the stuff that's not working well and make it positive. So I'd be delighted to take any questions anybody has.